into these topics of momentum and impulse, which uh, you were introduced to in your lab on Wednesday. And we talked briefly about it at the beginning, but we'll talk a little bit more about the stuff we talked about before the lab on Wednesday, talk a little bit about why the, you saw some of the things that you saw, look at some graphs, and we'll go from there. Okay? First, before we get into the relationship between the two, let's define momentum. Momentum is a term that I'm sure most of you have used before. And in your mind, you have a definition of what momentum is. Looking at books, I've seen it defined a couple of different ways. First, I've seen it defined as, quote unquote, a measure of an object's motion. I've also seen it defined as, quote unquote, inertia in motion which seems a little redundant to me, seeing as how inertia covers things in motion, but you know that's how I've seen it. Okay? Regardless of how you try to define it, though, in order to calculate it, you need to measure two things. Okay? The instantaneous momentum of an object, so its momentum right now, depends on two things, the mass and the instantaneous velocity. So we use the letter P to represent momentum. And the momentum of an object is equal to M times V. It's mass times its velocity. And it's the next thing that shows up on the wall. So if you on the left might not be able to see it because it's behind the projector. There it is. The momentum of an object is defined as its mass times its velocity. As far as the unit goes, we just mosh the two units that we use for mass and velocity together, right? Kilograms times meters over seconds. Nothing special, no special name or unit to represent that. Just the two things pushed, you know, mushed together. Yeah. If you go back think about what momentum means or what you thought it meant before this lesson started. You say, oh, that object has a lot of momentum, right? Most of you would probably associate it with something that's you know, going in a certain direction and hard to get it to change and stuff like that. But if you take a look at the things that influence momentum, right, its mass and its velocity, right? If you have something that has a large mass and it is going very quickly in a certain direction, it's going to be hard to get it to do something different, right? That's what momentum kind of means in everyday language, and that's kind of the things that make it up here at this point in time, too. Okay. Something important to keep in mind as we go forward. Momentum is a vector quantity, right? So that means that it tells us both magnitude and direction. That's going to be important, especially when you go back and start doing some calculations for this lab, because if you take a look at your data, some of your velocities are negative, some of your velocities are positive, so we have to make sure that we take care of those things. All right, good there with our intro to momentum? All right, where does this all fit together? In the last unit, we talked about Newton's second law. And Newton's second law relates three things for us, right? The force or the net force that's acting on that object, that object's mass, and the resulting acceleration that comes out of it. But if we go back to the beginning, we defined acceleration in terms of two things. What does acceleration depend on? Change in velocity and time, right? So one of the terms in this equation actually depends on two things itself. So we can substitute in delta V over delta T for the acceleration in that equation. And then, rearranging a little bit, we end up with this equation, right? Sigma F times delta T, net force times time, is equal to the mass of the object times its change in velocity. So we sort of introduced this before you guys did your lab on Wednesday. And what did we say this equation 
helps us relate into this whole situation? What factor does this one sort of make a little bit more apparent? The time factor, right? We may apply a huge force to something, but if we only apply that force for a very, 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 very short time, are we going to change the motion of the object all that much? Not necessarily. It really depends on how big of a force and how short of a time, but not necessarily. We refer to this equation here as the impulse momentum equation. The impulse momentum equation relates three factors dealing with the motion of the object or the change in that motion, right? How much force or net force is acting on that object? How long do we apply that net force? And then how much change in velocity do we get out of that? We'll assume that if we're talking about the same object, its mass is not going to change right in the middle of the situation. So the impulse momentum equation, which is the next equation that shows up on the paper, relates the force that's acting on the object, how long that force acts on the object, and the resulting change in its motion. So the sigma f, the delta t, and the delta v. change in the object's momentum. Impulse depends on the force and the time. The left-hand side of this equation that we just introduced, right, the force times the delta t, that's the impulse that is provided to that object. Impulse is caused by a net force applied for a certain amount of time. So we said that's really kind of the big factor that we're introducing here that makes this topic different or more specific than just Newton's second law when we deal with acceleration. It's by including that time factor. How long are we applying that force exactly? As far as the unit goes, Right, we just mash the two units together, newtons times seconds. We'll find that if we do a little bit of simplification there, that that unit comes out to be the exact same unit that's on momentum. It should be because in the impulse momentum equation, they're on the opposite sides of the equation. Things on different sides of the equation need to have the same units.
So the impulse causes a change in the object's momentum. So if we're going to change an object, right, probably force is going to be involved because that's what causes change, right, from the last chapter we talked about force. And then we also just, you know, we talked Wednesday, we talked earlier today about the idea that that time factor is also going to play a role. How long am I applying this force? If we go back to the equation, right, sigma f times delta t equals m times delta v, the right-hand side here, right, it has mass and it has velocity, just like momentum did, right? But because now it's delta v, that side now becomes the change in momentum. We're going to assume again that the mass of the object doesn't change right in the middle of the, you know, right in the middle of whatever the situation is. Good there. All right. Some demonstrations to move this concept along. Volunteers from the audience, anybody? Come on, Ted, you're close, so. All right. Where did my demonstration object go? There it is, okay. All right. So, Ted, first thing we're going to do, here's a string, right? There's a loop in one end of the string that has a rubber band, okay? And then this end of the string has a little loop. So I'm just going to put the mass through this little loop, okay? Okay. All right. So first thing I want you to do, you have to just stick one finger just through the, the loop of the string, not the rubber band, okay? okay? And then, in the same hand, in the same hand, we're going to hold on to the mass. And all I want you to do is just drop the mass and, okay? Good there, yes? Okay. So, let's talk about what happened. Go ahead, do it again. So, Ted drops the mass, right? First, is there a net force acting on the mass as it's falling? Yes, what is it? Gravity, right? So, acceleration probably pretty close to 9.81 for that time, right? Until the string becomes taut, right? Until it becomes tight, okay? Then, is there a net force applied to that mass again? Yeah, which way does that net force have to be now? The net force has to be upward, meaning the string has to be greater than whatever gravity is acting on that object because it comes to a stop. Okay? Good there? All right. Ted, next. Take your finger out of the loop of the string. Okay. Put your finger through the rubber band. Okay? All right. Same thing. Go. Okay? All right. So, anything different conceptually as far as the motion of the object goes? When Ted, leaves, when Ted lets go of the mass, is there a net force acting on it? Yeah. yeah, right? Then, net force of gravity, pulling it down, pulling it down, accelerating, accelerating until it gets to the bottom, right? But now, the string becomes tight, but how is it different than the previous situation? It does go up a little bit because of the rubber band, right? Ted, when you drop the two things, right? Which one was easier on your finger, the rubber band or the string by itself? The rubber band didn't hurt quite as much, right? Not that the string hurt a lot, but, you know, but, you know, it's you know, a little bit, okay? Less weight. Less, okay. Well, less. Not less weight, right? Yeah. Same weight, okay? Good there? Yeah. All right. Demonstration number three. You can take that off. Okay. I need this part. Okay. All right. This time, okay, you're going to take the string, hold it in your finger just like that, okay? Hold the slinky like this, and then you're just going to drop the slinky. Okay. okay? All right. So, go ahead and put your finger through there. Okay? Hold the slinky. Kind of hold it like this. Yeah, like that. Uh, hold your, you're probably going to have to hold it up like, over your head so, this, so it doesn't like hit the ground. Okay? All right. Whenever you're ready, go. Okay. All right. So, as far as this one goes, how does this one feel on your finger compared to the other two? Um... Did, was it harder or easier than before? Uh, kind of easier. Kind of easier? Okay, good. All right. The string's a little bit different this time, yeah. but um, hopefully it should be easier this time, okay? So, in all three cases, thanks, Ed. So, in all three cases, what happened? We start, okay, good job. Thanks, Todd. You've got to give people credit around here, so. All right, in all three cases, we drop this object, gravity accelerates it, make it go faster, 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 but eventually
eventually what happens to that object? It stops, right? In the case of the rubber band and the slinky, it stops and then it comes back up, but it still has to stop first, right? So, if we look at this equation, right? The impulse momentum equation that we just talked about. The right-hand side, was there anything different about the mass of that object in each of the three cases? No. Was there anything different about the change in its velocity? Hmm. Yeah. This one's a little bit harder. Yeah. Eventually, what happened to all three of them? Stopped. They all stopped, right? Yeah. Now, they didn't all fall the same <coughs> distance, right? When we did the, sh the first string of the rubber band, which I'm not totally oh, not seeing right now. When we did the first string of the rubber band, right, when it fell first, it fell this far. So gravity accelerated it a certain amount, we made it stop. When the rubber band fell this far, not that much farther, right, so the distance it fell was pretty much about the same, yes? Now, the slinky is a little bit different, okay? If I was good, I probably should have gotten a rope that was as long as the slinky, but I was doing this this morning before school and I didn't think of that, so anyway. But in that case, right, we would see that all in all was there any change in the, or was there any difference in the change in the motion of the object? No. But there definitely was a difference in how we did it, right? Okay. Here, this morning, I did the exact same thing that Ted did, but instead of holding my finger with the string, I was actually holding uh, the force sensor on the lab class. And I made these three pictures. Blue, red, green. Which one represents which situation? Nope. Blue is not the slinky. Blue is the blue is the string. Okay. If we take a look, sorry, I didn't label these axes. Force on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. What do we see about this blue? the blue peak here. How much force is the blue peak representing? A lot or a little? Yeah. A lot of force. But, that right, that's when this, because the, the string doesn't apply a force to the object until it gets taut, right? But once the string gets taut, how long does it take the mass to stop? A long time or a short time? A real short time, it stops like this. If we look on the x-axis, how wide is this peak? It's not very wide at all. That means the time that went by was very short, but we applied a very, very large force. Yes? Okay. For the red one, what do we see about the force value? About half, okay, but definitely, definitely smaller, yes? But what do we see about this peak, though? How wide is this one? It's a longer time. Did we accomplish the same thing with the rubber band that we did with the string? Yeah, we brought the mass to a stop. But with the string, we applied a really, really big force over a very, very short amount of time. With the rubber band, we didn't apply as great of a force, but we applied that force for a greater amount of time. The end result, though, was that we changed the velocity of that object. If you look at the green, right? Green's the slinky. How much force does the slinky have to provide? A lot or a little? A little. But how wide is that peak? It's much wider, right? It's almost a whole second. Whereas these maybe were only like, you know, some real small fraction of a second. Because the, the slinky spreads out and applies that force over a much greater amount of time. Why is that important to you? This is why it's important to you. In a car crash, your car experiences a force, and because of that force, it stops. But what do you keep doing? 
because of what? Because of inertia, right? You have your own inertia. Your car stops, but you keep going because you don't experience a force until you run into something. So now you've got choices. You've got this airbag or you've got the steering wheel. What does the airbag do when you run into it? It slows you down. But Roxanne, how much time does it take? Is the airbag the slinky or is it the straight? It's the slinky. It increases the amount of time that you are slowing down and coming to a stop. Will you come to a stop if you hit the steering wheel? Yeah. How quickly will that happen though? Right? If the time is real small, how much force has to be applied? A lot of force, right? Just like this picture. Right? You drop an egg. One time you drop it on the plate, the next time you drop it on a pillow. If you drop it from the same height, the change in the motion, the change in momentum has to be the same. Gravity, stop, right? But what does the pillow do? slows it down over a longer period of time. So if time is increased, how much force has to be applied? Less force. So in the case when the change in momentum is the same, a lot of times that when, that's when things stop, what kind of relationship do we see with force and time? What did the pillow do to the time? Increase. It increased the time. But what does that do to the force? Decreases the force. What kind of relationship is that? That's an inverse relationship. So when the change in momentum is the same, force and time have an inverse relationship. That's only true, though, when the change in momentum is the same. A lot, Like I said, a lot of times that's when it stops. see an inverse relationship between force and time if the change in momentum or the change in velocity is the same. Like I said, this egg, the demonstration that we just did with the string and the slinky, right? In each of those cases, the object eventually comes to a stop, but we can adjust the amount of time that that force is applied, and that then adjusts the amount of force that needs to be applied. time-lapse photograph of somebody swinging a golf club and hitting a golf ball. Okay? Hey, what? <laughs> Any golfers out there? Anybody? One person plays golf, that's it? A whole class? Tennis? So, it applies to any contact thing, okay? So, it applies to hitting a baseball, hitting a softball, tennis ball, golf ball, any of those things, okay? So, um, okay. Here, let's use golf as an example. In each case, when you hit the golf ball, what's its initial velocity? It's just doing what? It's at rest, so its initial velocity is zero. Okay. Do we want the change in velocity for the golf ball to be the same for every golf shot that we hit? No. When you hit a drive, what do you want delta V to be? If you hit a drive, you want it to be what? Because
because you generally want to drive to go far, right? Exactly. Come on, you better watch golf on TV. Helen. <coughs> so, when you hit a drive, we want delta V to be as big as we can, right? Because we want to go as far as we can. If we want to make the right-hand side of this equation big, what do we have to do? What's the gist of a mathematical equation? What do you know about the two sides? They're on the other side, yes. But what has to be true about the two sides? They have to be equal, right? That's what the equation is. So if we want to make this side, the right-hand side of the equation, as big as possible, what do we have to do over here? Make, well, we can increase the force, right? Or if we decrease the time, what's going to do over here? You're going to decrease it, right? We want to make both of these as big as possible, right? So when you swing a golf club and you want to hit the ball as far as you can, or when you swing a tennis racket and you want to hit the ball as hard as you can, or if you swing a baseball bat or a softball bat, right? You don't just stop once the ball makes contact with whatever it is that you're swinging, right? What do you do? You keep going the whole time because you're increasing the amount of time that those two things are in contact with one another, right? If I want to throw this ball as far as I can, where do I start it? Back here, right? Where do I let go of it? Way over here. Why? Because the whole time, what am I doing? Force, 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 right? I push hard on the ball, but I also increase the amount of time, right? That makes both of these things big, force and time, and that then makes the change in velocity big. But let's say you're playing darts, right? When you're playing darts or beanbag toss or whatever, right, you're not really worried about throwing it as far as you can, yes? So when you play darts, how far, how long do you apply the force to the dart? How far do you move your hand? Right? That far. Because you don't have to apply as much force. You don't have to apply it for as much time. Does that make sense? Okay. So in this case, right? In this case, we're still coming back to the impulse momentum equation. But when we're hitting this golf ball, we want the change in velocity to be as big as we can, at least when we're hitting a drive, right? So therefore, you make the force as big as possible, but you also make the time as big as possible. So you swing hard, but you also follow through, because when you follow through, now we're increasing the amount of time. sense there? So we're playing around with these factors in different ways to result in these different changes in motion. On the other end, using the golf ball example again, right? There are, sh there are certain shots where you don't want to hit the golf ball as far as you can, right? If you're close to the green, if you're putting or whatever, right? So when you're putting and you just want to hit the ball a real small distance, first, do you swing very hard? No. So that makes the force a lot smaller. But how far do you move the putter? Do you move it as far as you move it when you hit your drive? 
You only move the putter like this far, right? So that decreases the amount of time that's involved as well. Smaller force, smaller time means smaller change in velocity, which is okay when you're putting because you don't have to hit it that far. Good note? All right. Those are your basic concepts that go along with the lab that we started in on, on Wednesday. Okay. Uh, for the weekend, there are some problems from the book that deal with these concepts. They're all conceptual problems. They're not calculations just yet. We'll start in that on Monday. So these problems from the end of section 9.1 and then also the end of chapter 9 deal with those things conceptually, um, the stuff that we introduced today. Also, I'll put the, uh, I'll put the notes up here and I'll put the slides online, so if you want to get those, they'll be there for you as well. 